I am so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Every time we talk, we have a little bit different of a conversation. You know what I mean? We've talked about bodybuilding. We've talked about nutrition. We've talked about um, like real estate and kind of like the economy a little bit. And like that was back in like last year when things were, I feel like now, even though things are a little bit weird still, they're not as like uncertain. Like people know that like people know the weirdness that is right now like back then it was like what's going to happen now we kind of know what's oh going to happen God. but it is weird everything was crazy ever since you know the whole pandemic everything's just been like so crazy and now i finally feel like we have some stabilization and so people are like okay like they they're starting to feel more and more comfortable with like this is like our normal this is like our set you know our set climate that we're in <laughs> I mean, how does that like, how does having even a set climate change the way that you feel about things? Definitely like more certainty, um, able to speak on things with more clarity, I guess. Um, you know, back when everything was like so all over the place, a lot of realtors were just like, I don't know what's going on. Like, it just is what it is. Like they were kind of rolling with the punches. And now it's kind of like, now that it's a more set dynamic, you know, we're all kind of like, okay, this is like, we have enough data to be like, okay, this is kind of like what we see happening. You know, it's not like, you know, there's still people out there who I talk to who are like, they think the market's going to crash, which it's not going to, especially in places like Florida. I mean, we have a thousand five hundred people moving here every week. Like there's such an influx that we don't have enough houses to even support these people. So there's just, we're not seeing any upcoming signs of a slowing economy here or a slowing market. So um, until we have enough housing, home prices are still going to be on the rise. You know, they, they are appreciating at astronomical rates and I don't think it's sustainable per se, but at the same time, like supply and demand, it's like any other industry. How does like, how does that... Um, because so many people are moving there, like you said, and like, there's not enough houses. What does that do to, what does that do to like the builders and what does that do to like supply needs? Because is there still like, do you feel like that I have to order something like a year in advance to be able to get it in the real estate and in like the building markets? Or is that something that you know about? Yeah, actually I do a lot of new construction. So the majority of my business is actually new construction. Um, and I mean, I'm in a new construction home right now. This home was built in 12 months. Um, so by the time we went under contract, this we we got the home delivered exactly almost a year later. So yes, there is a timeline around that, but we are seeing more spec homes, which means homes that are pre-built or they're going to be delivered in a month or two. That wasn't the case during the pandemic. During 2021, you couldn't even get spec homes. I mean, there was wait lists. Builders had wait lists that were like a CVS receipt long. You know, it was like, we just like, you couldn't even get into, like there was literally communities people couldn't even get into. So it was crazy. It was stupid. It was wild. And now we're seeing, you know, it's slowed a little bit. Um, but an interesting fact actually is that I just sent out an email earlier today. One third of American buyers are paying cash which is really wild when you think about it. So, and in Florida, it's even more than that. It's around 40 to 50% are paying cash for all transactions. We're back in multiple offers right now. So like people are making multiple offers on houses. I mean, it's crazy. So right now I just feel like if you want to get a house, don't wait. Um, people who waited are now coming to me and saying we're priced out. Like we can't even afford to buy the house that we wanted to buy a year ago. And I always tell my clients, I'm like, if you, if you're ready to buy, buy, because the market only goes up, you know, in a climate like this. And so if you wait six months, you're going to be paying more. So it's, it's one of those things where, yes, you want to make smart decisions, but at the same time, if you can buy today, it's better than buying in the future. Interesting. What is like, what's pushing people with the cash in the, what, what's, what's causing that? So as you know, I don't know how close you pay attention to the housing market, but rates just shot up to their highest point, I think in like 14 years, something like that. So rates took a really big, massive turn and 
people don't want to pay the rates. I mean, I don't know the exact, I could pull up a calculator right now. I don't know the exact amount you'd be paying per month in interest on a like million dollar house, but it's a lot. And people on like a $500,000 house are paying a lot. I mean, this house right here, this is a townhouse and my mortgage is around, we put a lot down on this house. So we put $89,000 down on this house. That's including co closing costs and um, upfront costs. But my mortgage is around um, $2,600 a month. And that's before HOA and everything. And only $200 of that goes to the principal. So wow. that's a lot in interest. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. I mean, there's escrow in there too for taxes and all that. But the majority of that is an interest payment. So I'm at a 9% interest rate in this house. Interesting. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, people, it seems like the only thing I'm hearing from people these days about Florida is like, oh, it's so expensive to live there. Is that like a new thing? Is there a reason behind that? It seemed like, and especially with so many people moving there, like it's, it's almost contradictory, it seems like. Yeah. I mean, so compared to what, right? So compared to New York, compared to LA, Florida still... I mean, it's getting up there. Miami surpassed LA during the pandemic in expense, um, but it's still less expensive. You can get a single family house here where in California, you can't. I mean, California, you're buying an apartment for a million dollars. Here, you can actually get a actual house for the same amount. Um, but the reason why is really, I mean, during the pandemic, people wanted to move from New York, from LA to Florida. And Florida's growing really quickly. So it's developing where Orlando is a new city. It was, you know, about 50 years ago that it really started to bloom. That's when Disney came here. Before that, it was all orange groves. So this was a huge farming community. There's still cows, there's still orange groves, but they're developing at a rapid rate. So like if you drive down I-4, which is like the main highway here, it's always under construction. So if you're here trying to avoid it, it's the worst. But if you're driving down I-4, you'll see, I mean, things are just going up left and right. It's like new homes, um, restaurants, like all sorts of stuff. So we're getting a lot of uh, new things. Like we're getting a new day club, which is going to be like very tourist heavy. Um, we're getting new shopping malls. We're getting new attractions. We have a huge sports facility that's opening up here. Um, Man-made marinas, all sorts of cool stuff. So it's it's really started to develop, which is a huge attraction for people who, you know, enjoy that type of thing. So when they're in California or when they're in New York and they see, oh, I can live there cheaper, I can get more land, I can, you know, have the same kind of lifestyle for a fraction of the price, to them, it makes sense to move. To us, you know, it's just the cost goes up. Right. And this is something, you know, having watched a fair amount of, um, a show called Caribbean life. It's where they go down to like the, the Caribbean and they buy a house. Right. And, um, they'll be people from like California or something like you're talking about. And you know, their house there is like, you know, a million dollars and they're looking for a place in, in Puerto Rico or wherever. And it's like the difference in level of house that they can get from one place to the other is, I mean, does it just make sense to like, to I don't want to say downgrade, but like, does it make sense to almost like make that transition, you know, just for that economic reason? Here's the thing is that I miss living in California. I would move back actually. Um, because here's the thing is you, when you're paying all those taxes and everything, if you're just looking at it from an economic standpoint, yes, it makes sense to move to a place like this. But if you're looking at it from a lifestyle standpoint, there's so many differences between Florida and LA. There's so many differences between New York and LA. There's so many differences between like a new, a true New York person who loves the city and they love not having a car and they love that they can go down this, you know, down the elevator and go get a hot dog on the street. They love that they can, you know, go see a Broadway show. You're not going to have that same quality of life living here in Florida um, versus, you know, California, the beaches, um, the nice weather all year round. I'm going to tell you like Florida weather, people say it's beautiful all year round. They have not 
disclose the fact that you walk outside right now and your makeup's like ruined, your hair is ruined. That's why my hair looks like this right now. But you walk outside right now and it's just the humidity will like snap you up in a second and you're going to be looking like you just stepped out of the shower. So it's hot, it's sweaty, it's Caribbean. I mean, it's not Caribbean, but it's tropical. And so you know, there, there's pros and cons, but it really, if you're just looking at it from an economic standpoint, I mean, why not move to Ohio? Why not move to Indiana? Why not move to Minnesota? Like if you're looking at it from a like lifestyle standpoint, people want to be in the environment that they're going to flourish in. And I think that a lot of times you can't, you can't put a price tag on that. Like if you're going to be an actress or you're going to go be um, you know, on Broadway, then you're going to want to go to New York or to LA. That's just how it goes. I mean, obviously other than just like working and, and climbing the ladder, I guess, but like, what is the mobility for somebody coming from a place like Kentucky or Ohio, or Indiana, moving to Florida, moving to LA? Like, how do you, how do you, as a real estate agent, how do you like help people make that transition to like, here's, how you can make that transition and and not necessarily just have like this massive downgrade in what you can't afford and like the amount of house that you can have and all that kind of stuff. So that's a really good question. Um, I've worked with a lot of families who relocate from the Midwest or from, you know, other places like California. And the first thing I've noticed, and this is a very, um, I have to explain to them when they're first moving here that the architecture is not going to be the same as where they're coming from. Um, It's a very different environment here. There's a lot of cinder block. There's a lot of, you know, it's just a different um, aesthetic here, but also, you know, it's about finding their, (laughs) what they're interested in and really helping them to transition into a neighborhood that fits their lifestyle as best as possible. So, Um, for instance, a lot of my clients, when they're transitioning, they'll look up the hottest neighborhood in Orlando. And I'm like, that may not actually be for you because the house that you're going to be able to, you know, afford when you sell your house, isn't going to be what you're used to. So why don't we move you two little cities over? You still have access to that city, or we move you right on the edge of that city, but you're in the other one. That way you still have access to it and you're paying a fraction of the price. So it's all about figuring out how to kind of bend and play with the given criteria in order to get them what they're looking for and still have the lifestyle and the quality that they're used to. I just think it's so, so weird that we live in a world. So that's like so interconnected that we, but it's so interconnected, but then it's also so different from like one place to another. Like we know that prices in, you know, certain places are higher we know that and and at the same time like the it's almost like the same stuff is going on like there's not that much difference between the the life of a person in one city versus another but what their you know economic potential with the same dollar it's so much different it's just crazy to me like that we have access to like knowing that and 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 even though we like live a similar life things are so different from place to place yeah. I wanted to talk to you about the um the kind of the new niche that you're in and and you know explain a little bit about how you got into that and even though we're like 20 minutes whatever we are into this tell us a little bit kind of about yourself and how you got into real estate for people who didn't watch the first episode where we talked kind of mm-hmm. talked about that but then you know talk more about kind of the niche that you're in now too. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Um so I guess, let me like reintroduce myself to your listeners. I don't know if you guys have listened to my episode. I feel like Daniel and I have had so many conversations that it's just like, oh, hey, what's up, old friend? Um, My name is Celia Cavalli. I am a realtor here in Orlando, Florida. And I started about two years ago in the industry, over two years ago um, in the industry. And I always knew I had a feeling I was going to get into real estate, um, Growing up, I was always fascinated with homes. I was fascinated with architecture, but I do not have the math background to support being an architect. So, (laughs) and nor would I want to. I'm very much like, I like people. I like connecting with people. I like to laugh. I like to have a good time. And I like aesthetics. So for me, I was like, either I'm going to be an interior designer or I'm going to go into real estate. And I've been in sales my entire freaking life. And so it made sense for me to go into real estate. 
no day is the same. So every day is different. I love it. I thrive in it. It's amazing. Um, so yeah, that's how I got started in the industry. Um, I've had so many passions that have brought me to this point. When I got into real estate, I knew about divorce. So I'm friends with a lot of attorneys and, um, you know, a lot of my friends who are attorneys do business law and there's different niches inside of, uh, law as well. And I had a couple friends who did divorce law and, or family practice is what it's called. And I was just fascinated with it. Um, I'm really good with high conflict resolution and always kind of saw myself going into that because relationships are something that's so dynamic and so meaningful to me. Um, And if you pay attention to my content on Instagram, I put out a lot of how to not get a divorce because I think that, you know, you should be happy. And here's my whole standpoint on this is people should be happy and they should be able to live authentically. And that's really what I think is the most important thing in each and every human's life is to be able to live authentically. And I know, you know, I'm a realist as well. I know that people grow apart, people, you know, have issues and all of a sudden they, they need to get out of the situation that they're in. And one of the biggest things that actually can hold up a divorce is the sale of the house. So if the house needs to sell or if they have um, a lot of joint property, so let's say they own multiple homes, that can really, really hold up the process. So I made a commitment. I like to see people happy and thriving. And I knew that this was a industry that really was underserved. There's not a lot of realtors who are serving in this, in this capacity and nor do they want to, because there's a lot that goes into it. It's not an easy sale. It really isn't. There's a lot that goes into it. That's confusing, messy, and a lot of things that can go wrong. Um, and so for me, I was like, you know, I could really serve in this industry. I could really serve in this niche, this area at a very high level. And so I actually decided if I'm going to do this, I'm going to go through and do this the correct way. So I actually took a course by, I think it's called the Alumni um, Institute. It's a divorce institute. And so I decided to get my background in that and go through that. And eventually we'll go through certification, like a full certification for it, because I think education is really important. And I think staying on top of the industry you're in and the niche you're in is so important. So for me, I just, I fell right into it. It was one of those things where I was like, this could be so depressing and I could be so sad every single day being in this. But I found it to be very empowering to give people a second chance. You know, when I started meeting clients and hearing their stories, I was so moved and so touched. I was like, wow, the fact that people can begin again. And this is like a fresh, clean slate for a lot of people to really start their life over. And to me, that was everything. When I started to actually meet with people and hear their stories, I was like, this is why I do what I do. Are you looking for a supplement company that can help take your fitness game to the next level? Look no further than All Sport Pharmaceuticals. Their cutting edge supplements are scientifically formulated to give you the edge you need in the gym and in life. Whether you're looking to build muscle, increase endurance, or boost recovery time, All Sport Pharmaceuticals has you covered. And with a wide range of products designed for people of all levels, you're sure to find the perfect supplement for your needs. So why wait? Give your body the support it deserves with All Sport Pharmaceuticals. Visit their website today to learn more and start achieving your fitness goals. It makes so much sense that because that's like the first thing I thought of was you're going to be when you're buying a house or like some kind of property. It's like, oh, this is happy. This is like something that I'm looking forward to. But it's almost like it almost seems like the complete opposite. And in, in this other scenario where I'm trying to like move on with my life in a way I'm trying to like figure out my next steps. And this, this one thing is like holding up the process. I think real estate and any agents who are listening to this podcast will understand when I say this, I think real estate can really burn you out on people because you're seeing sometimes like real estate can be stressful. They say there's three stresses in life, death, divorce, and real estate or buying and selling real estate. Those are the three big stresses. Um, when you're dealing with two of them at the same time, hell yeah, absolutely. Like you can become so jaded, but at the same time, It's all in how you look at things because the truth is like, I mean, in any industry where you're dealing with humanity, like you look at like cops or anyone who's doing something where it's under stress, um, you can become jaded and working in an industry where there's high conflict and you're seeing people's like, you know, bad sides can come out, can be really um, disheartening. But at the same time, 
I think it's all in how you view it and work with it too. Um, because at the end of the day, once it's everything settled and the two parties are moving on, like you can find a piece in that. And I think it's kind of just what you, you can make it what you want it to be. And you can choose to see the good in people and choose to see the good in the situations and help coach people to see that too. So like, that's, that's kind of my whole thing is like, this is like divorce doesn't have to destroy you. You know, divorce can be a, a chance to start new. And honestly, I believe so much in like manifesting great people into your life and manifesting good scenarios. And so thankfully, I mean, the people who I've worked with have been pretty great people. And so yes, little scenarios can happen here and there. And yes, it can get complicated and messy, but um, it's kind of like, you know, a family reality show in a way it's, it's drama, it's messy, it's crazy. But at the end of the day, you know, you're really helping people and you're really helping to make a difference. And that's just what I, I stick to when it gets hard. I'm just like, Hey, I'm in this to make a difference. So. Right. Does it, does, have you ever been in like any like awkward, like, Oh, wow. I wish I wasn't kind of like in the middle of the situation in this particular second, like, have you ever been in the middle of that? <laughs> um, so we try and stay as neutral as possible. Like it's really, you want to like always try and stay neutral, but there's a lot of awkwardness. I mean, anytime you're going through any type of messy conflict, there's going to be awkward moments. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. what's, what's like, what are the biggest differences in your like day to day or like how you kind of operate on a daily basis from, you know, going from whatever, like, quote, normal or standard, you know, to working with in like a divorce setting? That's a great question. Um, so I still do a ton of residential. So right now, actually, my, pretty much all of my current clients are happily married residential contracts. So it just kind of like it's it flows um it just depends like i don't just do divorce real estate so like i think it's funny because when people get into niches people think like oh that's all they do you know like a lawyer typically that's all they'll do is like if they go into like personal injury like they're just personal injury um i don't know if they would take other cases but usually they just hyper specialize in real estate i still do a lot of relocation new construction and working in residential so like we kind of wear a lot of hats. Um, so it's, it's very broad, but I chose to focus on divorce because that was really where I decided like, Hey, I really want to service at a higher level here. So, um, it was, it was a decision to do that, but at the moment I'm currently doing more residential than I am divorced, but that will eventually change over as I take on more and more divorce. Gotcha. So working with more attorneys and, um, in the divorce real estate world, it really is once you get in good with etern- attorneys, they start to use you as a referral. Gotcha. And is there any like, does the process take longer? Is it is it typically like a slower kind of more methodical thing? It can take longer. Hopefully it doesn't. <laughs> but usually um, in a divorce situation, they there will be timelines for things and you need to, you need to know your shit. Like you have to sell the house, you know, you have to have that timeline down tight. You have to have the pricing right. Um, in order to sell, it's important to really serve your client by being ethical and by really making sure that you have a seamless approach that you know how to sell homes. This is somewhat related, but kind of not really. I was listening, I heard somebody say, I was listening to something. Somebody said they, it was like, if you, Like if you're on somebody's home, what's it called when you like you buy the house and then you like your name's on the, um, on the title, on the title. Yeah. Like if you're on the title, but you're not something to do with like the main person on it or something like your, um, like your credit is affected differently or isn't affected. Like, is that, is that, Oh, this is one of my favorite conversations. Okay. So I call it married to the mortgage. Um, Okay. So this is really important. And I hope that if you have any listeners who are going through this process, that they understand this, um, is that there's two things that are, and so, okay. So there's two things that are separate, the mortgage, which is your loan and the title, which is your ownership of the home. 
They're totally separate. So just because you're taking off the mortgage doesn't mean you're taking off the title. So you're still an owner of the house. And just because you're taking off title doesn't mean that you were taking off mortgage. So you're still responsible for paying half of that mortgage. So if that mortgage, if they end up not making the payment, it can ding your credit. And it is a bad ding. A missed mortgage or a late mortgage payment can ding your credit a lot. And this can really negatively affect the divorced the divorced person when they go to buy a new home or to refinance and all of a sudden their credit is lower, you're going to get a worse rate. So you want to make sure that when you are going through a divorce, I know a lot of times um, the couple will both stay on title so that the, the home, they can stay in the home. One of them can stay in the home. It's not the smartest thing to do. So in that case, I mean, it's, it's always better and everyone's situation is different. I want to make that disclaimer, but it's always better to have a clean, clean cut tie because things can get very messy down the road. So if they end up getting any liens or encumbrances on the house, you can be responsible for that. And that can affect the sale of your own home as well. So clean cut ties are always what what we would suggest um, in terms of real estate, because there are situations actually where someone will get remarried. They'll be living in the same house. They'll get remarried. But because the ex-wife is on the title. So let's say this, let's say Daniel was married to, we'll say Karen before, and they got a divorce and Karen and Daniel are still on the title. Um, And then Daniel gets remarried to Jessica. And then Jessica and Daniel are now going through a divorce. And Daniel's like, I'm ready to move on. Like I'm done with dating or I'm done with marriage. I'm just going to date, whatever. So Daniel's getting a divorce with Jessica. Well, now we have to get Karen involved in the sale of that house. If you can't find Karen, or if you can't get in touch with Karen, you can't sell the house. It becomes a very messy thing. So it's really important that if you are, you know, moving on that, as clean cut ties as you can is going to be key because you just don't want to get to that point later on in life. And then (laughs) you're like, Oh shit, we can't find Karen. I can't sell this house. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do, you know, and vice versa with the mortgage too. I mean, having someone on there who is messing up their own credit and everything, it's just, it's a messy, it's messy situation. So you want to make sure that you're just audio say goodbye completely by taking people off the title and off the mortgage. So in that scenario, would Karen, their original wife, would she be entitled to any of like the, the selling of the house, like any decision-making or any of the, you know, money made, like anything like that? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that's where you'd have to get attorneys involved, but she would be involved in signing off on papers. So when it, comes to selling the house, she would have to sign off on it. And that can make things really, really sloppy. Yeah. So even if it's agreed, like when they get divorced, that some arrangement is made with the house, even if like, if she's still on there, it's still kind of like not finished business, not finished business. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. (laughs) So we call it like married to the mortgage or, you know, just staying on title. It can be very problematic. So basically, if you're if you're the one that has the house and you're the one that's in the house, make sure that you're the only one or one, you know, the one of the two that's on both the mortgage and the titles, basically the thing to do. Correct. And I would also say this, too, um, for anyone who's not married or anyone who don't co-sign on people's loans or mortgages, um, <laughs> They could have the, you could have the best intentions. They could be a great person, but people are messy. And, you know, the the worst thing is to mess up your life because of someone else's mistakes. And I mean, these are huge legal things. It's like when you sign a mortgage or when you, you're going through the loan process, you're, I mean, people who go through the loan process for the first time are like, I'm giving you everything. I'm giving you my soul and paperwork. I mean, it's a lot of stuff that you have to like provide to the lender in order to get a loan. It's, it's not a easy thing. It's not a simple thing. Um, so when you are co-signing on someone's mortgage, I mean, you're really giving away a lot of your 
Right. And I just, I would hate for people to get into that situation because you can't just say, oh, I was just trying to be a nice person or I was just trying to be a good person or I was trying to help out little Jimmy or, you know, it's <laughs> at that point, it's like you've given up a lot of your, you know, a lot of your rights when it comes to that. So just be smart, just be smart when you make those decisions. And being a co-signer, like, is there, is there a point in time that comes that if the person is like, if the person that wanted the house and is getting the house, like gets enough money into it or their credit goes up enough or whatever the situation is, is, can that co-signer come off? You can refinance. Um, yeah. So you can, you can take someone off. Yeah. You can definitely take someone off the mortgage. Absolutely. Gotcha. So at some point you would just have to like either accept a, a worse rate, I guess, or build up your own to get that similar. I think there's another way and I'm not a lender, but I think there's a way that you can just drop someone off of there. I'd have to figure that out. But I think typically I think what happens is they refi, but I think you can just drop someone off. I'm not quite sure on that. Don't hold me to that. Anyone who's watching this, but I would ask your lender, um, and see what they can do about that. So if you have a lender that you've worked with, if you have someone who's on that you want off, or if you are on and you're like, my kid's crazy, I don't want to be a co-signer anymore for this person, um, talk to the lender. You can always call your lender. So you mentioned people um, who like aren't married and they, they get a house. Is it similar, pretty similar like advice or is it is it different as far as like, okay, we just want to live together. We're not getting married. How does that work? So are they buying a house together and they're both on title and they're both on the mortgage? Yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, it's, um, yeah. I, I mean, here's how I would maybe go about it. If you wanted like a cleaner situation is I would kind of do it like a roommate situation where one person is buying the house and then the other person is kind of like paying them rent. But the only downside to that is then the person who's paying the rent is not technically an owner. So they're not building equity and it's probably that's, that can be very problematic too. So, I mean, you could have both people on title, but if you're not married, there can be issues with that too. So if you were to go that kind of like roommate route would the person that also maybe provided part of the money for the payment, you know, the, especially like the initial payment and then like the monthly payment, are they also entitled to, any money when the house is sold or is it like, okay, you're not on the title. You're kind of out of luck. They would both have to be on title. Gotcha. Yeah. So at that point, just get yourself a sugar daddy. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. But no, seriously, at that point, I think, um, it would be better to like both be on title, but, and you could definitely do that. I mean, I've heard of friends buying houses together, but that can be really problematic. I mean, we've seen a lot of that actually, because the price of housing is going up so much that boyfriend and girlfriends are buying houses and they're breaking up within six months. And it's like, <laughs> it's almost like a divorce because they can't stay in the house. So then all of a sudden they're calling us up and they're like, Hey, you know, I know we just bought this house six months ago, but and the worst thing you can do is buy a house and then, you know, have to sell it right away when you haven't really built that much equity in it. So it can be problematic. I mean, if you've been dating forever and you're basically like, you know, you're going to be together, I guess. But like, if you're like a new couple and you're like, let's save a couple, you know, thousand dollars a month by buying a house together. I think the maybe better solution would be to rent or do a rent to own situation versus doing the, um, buying the home, unless you know, you're going to be together. Right. I mean, expect like in a time like this, where you said like, uh, prices are kind of going up still, mm -hmm. would it be almost like advantageous to put yourself into that possible situation? Like not necessarily with the intent of, I don't know, maybe possibly the intent of being like an investment, but like, okay, we're, we both need somewhere to live even if things don't work out and we have to sell this, at least we can make some money in the short term or that just be kind of too complicated. Here's what I would do. Um, if I were starting over again and I were, and I should have done this, I honestly should have done this a million years ago. So I would do something called house hacking where I would just buy a house and then rent out the rooms to boyfriend, girlfriend, friends, whatever 
Like this is for the people who are like, Hey, I don't want to pay rents anymore. Rent's crazy. Um, but I also don't make enough to really pay for a house or I don't want to say don't make enough. Cause then you won't qualify for the loan, but you know, you don't feel comfortable spending all that money on a house and you really want to live, you know, below your means. I would do house hacking, which is a very popular thing. You'll see it all over like TikTok and YouTube. And it's like the hot trendy thing. And, um, I think a lot of people don't understand it. They think that like, oh, buy a duplex and rent out one side of it. That doesn't always happen. And duplexes are very rare, especially here in Orlando. We really don't have any duplexes. Um, so the way that I would do it is I would just do what my roommate did back in the day when I was a teenager. I was like 19 living with um, two guys in a single family house in Edina, Minnesota. <laughs> and they were so much fun. We had the best pizza parties and like, we were just wild. It was so much fun. So, um, the owner of the house was like a 45 year old single guy, right? Like crazy ass dude. I hope he's doing well, but he was a lot of fun. Um, he was just, you know, wanted to make extra money and he rented out the house to Ben and I, and we paid, I don't even know how much we paid, but we basically paid his mortgage between Ben and I. So he had no mortgage. How amazing is that to have no mortgage? He was living in this nice house, huge yard, building equity, and he has no mortgage. That's what I would have done. I mean, he had to put up with Ben and I's craziness, but <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I'm not that bad, am I? Um, he had to put, put up with having roommates, but at the same time, he didn't have a mortgage. So it's kind of like, is that worth it to you? Um, if it is, then yeah. And I mean, if he was dating someone, I'm sure they would have paid you know rent or whatever to live there. Um, I personally would never, ever pay rent to a man I lived with, but <laughs> that's another subject. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, totally a hundred percent, like that would be the way to go about it. If you wanted to, you know, kind of cut down on your costs, I think that would be a smart way to go about it is to do like the house hacking where you have roommates who are paying, you know, a certain amount and it covers your mortgage or at least the majority of your mortgage. Mm. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Another thing you can do too, this is another like thing you could do is buy a house, live in it for two years, fix it up, buy like a real, like you really need to fix it up like a POS, right? It's, it's a good price buy it and fix it up, live in it for two years and then flip it and buy your next one. When you do that, you get the primary um, interest rate on the house. So you're not doing, cause this house is a, at a secondary, this is an investment property so this one's at a really high interest rate. Anytime you get a second home or a investment home, you're paying out the butt for your interest rate. So if you want to avoid doing that, this is the best way to kind of do the flipping thing is you buy a house, fix it up while you're living in it, and then you go to your next flip. So you sell that, you get a profit, you buy the next home. So it's kind of like a building block. So you start off when you're, you know, maybe younger, you don't have a lot of money. So you're starting off in your starter home. It's not going to be glamorous, but as you build equity, you start rolling that in. As you fix these houses up, you start to make more money on them. And from there, you can get better and better houses. You can make a lot of money from doing that. Gotcha. And is that better or I don't say better, but financially kind of more sound than just being like, I'm going to save up for a while and then get the house that I want to live in for ever potentially. Yeah. A hundred percent. Gotcha. Yeah. Cause if you wait on your house, you're not building equity. And so you're not being able, you're not able to roll that equity into your next house. So for instance, had I bought a townhouse or a single family house when I was younger, I would have started to build that equity um, on my house. I made $100,000 on this house within one year, a year and a half in equity because they just finished the community. So they're at sellout. Prices are crazy. And so you can make a lot of money if you know what you're doing in real estate. You always want to have that equity building. Um, anytime you're paying rent, you're paying hundred percent interest rate to someone else. Like you don't see that money ever again. You want to make sure that you have something that you're putting money into that's hedging inflation that you're going to have, you know, as a, as a starter, like an egg nest for your next home. It's really important. I think that home ownership is like very undervalued. I mean, it's a lot of work and it can be expensive, but it's worth it in the long run. 
Yeah, I've never thought about it like that, the 100% interest rate thing. Looking for a supplement company that's as serious about your fitness goals as you are? Allsport Pharmaceuticals is here to help. Their top-of-the-line supplements are designed to help you get the most out of every workout with ingredients that have been scientifically proven to enhance performance and recovery. Whether you're a seasoned athlete or just starting out on your fitness journey, Allsport Pharmaceuticals has the perfect supplements to help you achieve your goals. Plus, with their commitment to quality and safety, you can trust that you're getting a product that's both effective and reliable. So what are you waiting for? Take your fitness game to the next level with Allsport Pharmaceuticals. Visit the website today to learn more. This podcast is sponsored by Smoking Gun Coffee, a veteran-owned coffee company that strives to give back to those in need. Don't forget to use code TWR10 for a 10% discount at checkout. If you are renting your house to someone for like what you said, the the scenario one, um, is there any like legality behind like, I know now it's so hard with like tenants and renters for like getting money or getting people out if they aren't paying like how does that work in terms of okay i want to sell the house now but these people are still in here and they're not moving hire a lawyer (laughs) hire an attorney to help you out with that um i'm not an attorney so i can't give legal advice but i'll say just hire someone who knows what they're doing so that you have contracts in place that can cover things like that gotcha is there like a um time frame on that like we do this for this amount of years and then we like move on to kind of like the next level or like, I mean, I guess you could do it anyway you want, or is it like, we're going to do this till we pay off our, you know, the, the, a lot of the interest or like, how, do, how does someone like decide, like, I finally want this house for myself, if that makes sense. Uh, I guess it's like each individual person, whenever you're ready to kind of say, see you later, like, <laughs> I'm ready to not have roommates. Um, but I mean, I, th- I would think that you'd get to a point where you've paid off a lot of your mortgage and you could be someone too, who's making double payments on your mortgage. So like you're making your payment as if you were living there alone and then they're making the other payment for you. So it's like, I heard somewhere that if you paid an extra mortgage payment one time a year, it shaves off like I'm going to butcher this so bad. I'm not good with things like this, but it pays off. Like, I think like five years early or 10 years early off your, that's a lot for one extra payment. So imagine if you're doing that and I totally messed that up. So you guys don't talk to your lender. Don't, don't come at me. But like, if you were to pay two payments, you're going to pay it off way earlier than you would if you were only making one payment. And it's not going to be by half because every time that you're making that extra payment, especially early on, you're taking a huge chunk of that principal payment down, which then in turn takes the interest rate or takes the interest down. So it's major. I mean, that's like real major. Right. So kind of like free advice a little bit for myself here. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm looking to look at things in the next, you know, look at houses in the next um, about year now. So what would be your advice for someone who isn't necessarily like in the stages of with a real estate agent yet, but they are in the process of like maybe saving some money and looking for what they like. And maybe they're like a year out from actually looking to buy, if that makes sense. Uh, why don't you have a real estate agent yet? (laughs) I guess technically I have a contact or two, but (laughs) I haven't, I'm not, I guess I don't know. I guess I've just been stalling. (laughs) It's never too early to reach out and game plan. So here's what I would suggest is I would talk to a lender and a realtor or talk to a realtor because they're going to have lenders that you can get in touch with. But that's how I would do it. Because even if you're a year out, two years out, you can get familiar with the market. They can fill you in on stuff. You get on their email list. Um, Also, you can, you can have them set up a home search for you. Just be super honest with your realtor. Say, Hey, listen, I'm not willing to get started, you know, until like six months from now, a year from now, like I'm not ready, but I'm just getting my feet wet and I want to see what's out there just so I can prep myself, you know, in case something comes up or, you know, whatever. So they can get you in touch with a lender and then you guys can all game plan. And it's like one big team. You're all getting on the same page and they can really help you to, you know, get everything ready and to see what loan options are available for you. Because I've actually heard of people waiting and waiting and waiting. They go in, they talk to a realtor and a lender and realize they could have bought the house six months 
previously because they don't have to put as much down. So I think a lot of people think like, oh, I need 10% down. You do not. Um, You can put as little as like 3%, even nothing down. So I think really talking to a credible lender is, is really in your best interest to game plan because they'll help you with things like credit scores. Um, They'll help you with uh, financing, like money down, closing costs, things like that. Um, They can help you to prepare for that so that you know what to expect because the worst thing is to not know what to expect. So I think it's never too early to get in touch with a realtor and a lender. Just my two cents. Yeah, And it's going to help you too. Like mentally, you're going to be like so much more excited when the time comes, you're going to be like, wow, I have like everything I need. I feel super confident. And, you know, it's, it just, it's very helpful. I think to have your ducks in a row and to be able to know, like, this is the realtor I like to work with. This is the lender I trust. This is, you know, this is the process. You're familiar with the process because they filled you in on it beforehand. Um, instead of waiting until it's go time. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I don't know what's going on. Like, you know, it's, I need to close within a month. And I realized, you know, that I'm not ready or, you know, things like that. I think it's, I think it's never to like, it can't hurt to plan ahead of time. Kind of a scenario situation, kind of looking into the future a little bit. Like if you were in a home and like, let's say, you get a house, your first house, let's just say for whatever reason, and it's a house that fits you for the rest of your life. You don't necessarily need to get a bigger house because you have kids or whatever. Are you better off staying in that house forever or are you better off like building equity? And then, you know, in terms of like economically speaking and financially speaking, are you better off um, kind of like building equity and then selling that house and kind of moving up to maybe a little bit more expensive of a house and then kind of repeating that process a few times. So then like at the, when you want to move back down to that smaller house, maybe when you're a little bit older, you have more of like a, a bigger investment to sell. What's your goal? I guess the goal would be to, to almost like maximize the house's resale value. Like am I better off staying in one house for 40 years or staying in a house, maybe 10 years and then moving up to maybe a little bit bigger house for 10 years or five years or whatever that time frame is. And then at the end of the day, you know, in 45 years, when I'm 65 or a 70 or whatever, I have something. Well, will the bigger house that I've maybe paid a little bit more for be worth selling? And I know this is like specific to some, you know, more specific details, but yeah, is it better to kind of have that bigger or more expensive house to sell at the end of the day or that house that you maybe paid less for, but now it's worth more because just time and everything like that? So I think there's definitely, and each home is going to be different depending on like neighborhoods. This is why hyper-local realtors are so important. Um, And goals, you know, your goals and also your appetite for staying in the house you're in. Like, are you happy there? Um, there's so many factors that go into this, but it's hard to say because here's what I would personally do. And here's what I plan on doing is buying homes. Like I would rather stay in one house that I like and buy homes in other places as investment properties and trying to do it in cash so I can avoid that interest rate, um, where possible, but buying additional homes is really like where I think is you can make a lot of money because here's the thing is if you know the up and coming areas and you know, the up and coming develop, you know, development areas like Mineola right now is a really hot one. St. Cloud is hot. Um, so there's all these new neighborhoods that are really underdeveloped. And once they finish those neighborhoods, the homes are going to be worth like double. So in that situation, it's really a smart investment. And I know a lot of people who do this um, where they'll buy up homes, they live in their home, their main home, but they're buying, you know, vacation homes or buying rentals that they have people live in and rent. And that way they're building equity and all of that. So there's so many different ways to do it. That's the thing that excites me about real estate is there's not just one way to do things. There's so many options. There's so many ways to make money. There's so many ways to really get involved in real estate and make it you. So it really is about your, your goals and your mission and what you're looking to do. But the, the situation you were talking about where you're upgrading your living. Absolutely. But with that bigger house comes probably a bigger HOA and, 
So it, it's kind of like, it just depends, right? So like, it depends, it depends if there's, you know, bigger HOAs, it depends on, you know, property taxes, all of that. So it could be actually a better move to stay in the original home and then maybe invest that money into investment properties or invest that money into uh, buying commercial real estate or maybe, you know, flipping real estate or whatever it may be. So there's so many different ways to go about that. And then something that I actually asked you about um, on social media a while back that I want to kind of touch on on this podcast is the percentage down. And, and I was like, am I better off putting, you know, 20% down or whatever to maximize that percent down and decrease, you know, all that I can decrease from that end? Or am I better off um, taking less percent down and using that same money as like an, in another investment? Um, tell, talk a little bit about that. And I know it's going to depend on goals and stuff. Yeah, it's going to depend on goals. Um, but also, I mean, not necessarily because a lot of reason why people would put down, sorry, I'm getting a call. A lot of the reasons why people would put down 20% is to avoid PMI. But there's this whole thing with that where a lot of banks charge an extra, like somehow they're able to get that same price put in on a non-PMI. So you're not necessarily saving more money. Um, what it's going to do is it's going to lower the interest that you're paying on the house, but a lot of times it's not by much. So what I would do is I would talk to a lender, like a qualified good lender, talk to a good lender and see how much it's actually lowering your payment per month, because it may not make sense to put an extra 50 K down and you could save that money and use that money for upgrades, enhancements, um, you know, anything that you need to, you know, there's always going to be things that pop up in the house, um, that you're going to need money for. So I say, if it's going to like reduce your monthly payment by $50, is that really worth it? Maybe not, you know, maybe it's better that you keep that money or you put that 50 K into a CD or whatever it may be. And you can make that back, you know, it's, it's not always advantageous to put that big chunk of money down. So I would just talk to a lender and see like if this, what your options are as far as loans go and programs, there's, you know, different programs you can do. So I would definitely talk to a lender. There's um a lot of really cool new programs out for lending and I'm not a lender, so I can't speak to these a billion percent, but there's new programs for entrepreneurs that a lot of people will want to pay attention to. If you're a small business owner, um, there's ways to qualify for loans now where you don't need to uh, have like the tax returns because a lot of times with business owners, they don't show as much income on the tax returns. They have a new way to do it with like your bank balance, I believe. So um, that would be a really good way for you to buy a house if you're in that realm. I know a lot of YouTubers are in that realm. A lot of, you know, maybe people who are listening to your podcast who own personal training companies or, you know, gyms, and they are like, how am I ever going to qualify for a loan? I don't know. Um, there's a lot of new programs out. So I would just talk to the lender and see what your options are, because you may be surprised. You may be like, wow, I had no idea I could qualify for a lot more or a lower percentage, or you just don't know until you talk to someone. Right. And then what if you didn't like, what if you decided to do like a smaller percentage down, but then would there be any difference in that? And then being like, okay, I uh, only put maybe 3% down, but I have all this extra money. I'm going to just go ahead and put it like towards the payment. Like, would that make any sense in any way? Or would it just kind of be like the same thing? Kind of the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Um. Yeah. Kind of the same thing. I mean, You'd have to run the numbers um, with a lender, but a lot of times it'd be probably the same situation. Yeah. Right. Gotcha. It was really good getting a chat with you tonight and, and getting some stuff kind of figured out and, and hopefully helping some people out there who are, who are going through a similar situation as me and kind of, like yeah. I said, learning a little bit about what you're doing now. My biggest advice is just don't do it alone. Like get a good team around you and make sure you feel supported and that you have people who are smarter in that area than you so that you can push all that off on them and you don't have to figure it out all yourself. You know, yeah. like you're a genius in your realm. You should have the geniuses that you need, like finance stuff. I'm like, got to call Matt. I, I don't know. That's, that's Matt's, you know, so having the right people in your corner who you trust, who you like, who are, who have your back, who are smart in that, 
in that realm. I think that's really, truly like the biggest life hack that way you don't feel like you need to. And I, I will, I'm all for education. I think you should know as much as you can about as many things as you can, but at the same time, having people who are, you know, more versed in that area who can explain it to you, it's key. And I think that it's great that you do this podcast because you get to talk to people in every single industry. I know you work mainly with athletes, but um, I think it's really cool that you're able to learn and soak in all this wisdom from every, like, you're probably going to be the smartest person in the next five years. Like we're all going to be coming to you for advice on things because you're just going to know everything about everything. So I think it's really cool that you do this, this podcast. It's really awesome. Well, it's people like you who, you know, supply me with those answers. So, I mean, I can only give props to, to my guest. And, uh, um, if people want to reach out to you, where can they do that? Like what, what's your contact or social media info? Yeah. So, um, if you want to reach me directly, my number is 407-669-6213. So you can always text me on that number or call me. I don't really pick up calls. So text me is best. Um, and then Instagram is I am Celia Cavalli and that's Cavalli with two L's. And then I am on Facebook. I do have a Facebook group. That's all about mindset. If you're into that, um, it's called aligned and empowered. You're going to see me looking like this. (laughs) <laughs> that's the group. Um, and I'm also on YouTube as well. Just type in my name. I have two YouTube channels. One's a real estate and then one's kind of like a perfume mindset channel. So you can find me on all platforms. Just type in my name and you'll be able to see me on all of them. If you're tired of searching for a coach or trainer, somebody who knows what they're talking about and has experience, make sure you go check out the new coaches corner on weightroompodcast.com. You can find quality qualified coaches to help you achieve your goals, whether that's in bodybuilding or just general fitness. Stop wasting time and start achieving your goals today. The link to the Coach's Corner is down in the description below.